afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you here at EastFest 2022. Uh, my name is Ben Mwine, and I'll be delivering a keynote this afternoon on what we are going to be discussing in the afternoon as we come close to the end of what's been an exciting three days here at the festival. Uh, a big thank you to all of you for joining the discussion online. We've been trending in Uganda throughout the last three days, and I'd like to encourage you to continue doing that so we can finish with a proper bang. Our hashtag is EastFest2022, so please make sure to uh, use that hashtag and, of course, share as much of the things that have stood out for you as possible during the session. As we wrap up later on, we're going to have some very, very exciting performances. I won't spoil the surprises for you. You'll find out a little bit later on. However, what we're going to do is we'll have some breakout sessions, which I will come and tell you a bit about. But to get us started for our afternoon session now, we're going to be talking about um, who tells the stories and who doesn't, how to make the main stream um, media agenda more inclusive, and who best to steer this session than the incredible Edith Kimani, everybody. <laughs> Come on, you can do better than that. Uh, thank you very much. Before we begin, I have a small announcement from the breakout session. These belongings have been found. And so they belong to someone. If they are yours, you will find them at the back there with our technical team. Right? There's a pair of sunglasses, there's a phone, a notebook, and another notebook. Right, so how's everybody feeling? Oh, come on, guys. Are you still with us? Are we together? Yeah. Are we really together? Yeah. Okay, please stand up and just uh, shake it off a little bit. That food needs to go down. Come on, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Okay, you can have a seat. Thank you. Right, so you saw what the conversation is that we're going to be having uh, this afternoon. I think if you are First of all, the language we use to describe human beings. We say that they are normal human beings. And if you fall in this quote-unquote normal range, then I'm sure you don't think about things like, how do blind people enjoy music? Who gets to tell stories about the deaf community? What happens to people who are on the margins of society, perhaps because of illness, perhaps because of poverty, and perhaps because of other extenuating factors? And who gets to decide how those stories are told? Well, those are the questions that we're going to be trying to answer this afternoon. But before we do so, I'd like to invite onto the screen, joining us from Nairobi, Mr. Hesborn Hansen Owila. He works at the Aga Khan University's Graduate School of Media and Communication. He's a research associate, and as part of that team at the Media Innovation Center. Hesbon works with the team in researching innovations and media viability. And so we thought we'd kick off this section by asking him, Hesbon, first of all, hi, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good to see you too. I'm so glad that you're energized. Obviously, you did not have ugali for lunch like some of us. Uh, so it's I great. Did. <laughs> Why don't we start with a very general question of what does media inclusion actually mean? Well, uh, I think from uh, the academy, uh, it, it is it is fairly difficult to just have a one generic definition of what media inclusion is. Uh, therefore, I'll just focus on what are the key indicators of what media inclusion is all about. So media inclusion generally is about, uh, one, the content, and then number two, the consumers of that content. So it's... About the content, media inclusion basically speaks about who, whose content does the media cover and who is left out of this content, which stories are told, and who is telling these stories, whose interests are privileged and whose interests are left out. So to that extent, then media inclusion can be looked at in terms of the content. What does the content say about the people who are in this content as the storytellers and the people whose stories are being told. 
And then number two, we can also look at media inclusion in terms of consumers, you know, and ask ourselves, who are the consumers of this content? So who are we targeting with this content? And who has access and who does not have access to this content? So when we talk about uh, consumers and access to content, you realize that because of access, there are certain people who are then excluded and there are people who are included. And it does help them to understand the society much better when we look at the stories that are told in terms of the guys who are included in the stories and the guys who are left out in terms of consumption and access. But then again, uh, the third key thing about media inclusion is where do we have the media domiciled and uh, how are journalists and media houses distributed? And you realize that for folks where journalists are not present, where media houses are not domiciled, they're technically included out of the conversation. And they're included in the sense that they could be having access to the media, in which case they can consume that media, but then that media does not tell the realities of the stories around them. And I think this is the most uh, unique uh, and peculiar uh, pattern of media inclusion and exclusion in most of uh, the developing world, where we are informed by a variety of media uh, content producers, but then these media content producers are not domiciled in the areas where we are, and therefore we get stories about other people and not our stories. So we are essentially excluded as part of the content because of where the media is domiciled and where these journalists are distributed. It's actually interesting that it's pulling a thread that was uh, started this morning by Ben Mwine. Uh, but then, in speaking about that, those who are included obviously have no incentive to change the status quo. So what should we do so that everybody cares about inclusion? Well, I think there are so many things. Yeah, First of all, uh, when people talk about media inclusion, uh, everyone is making you know, their statements about media inclusion. But the most important thing is data. Where do we get the data just to show that there are people who are included, there are voices that are in the media and there are voices that are not there. There are people who are rich and there are people who are not rich. There are people who are targeted and there are people who are not targeted. So once we have that data, then it, it's easy to then have conversations of how do we then remedy the situation? How do we ensure that all voices are included? How do, you have, uh, how do you ensure that everyone has access to this information? Most importantly, how do you ensure that everyone is part and parcel of this uh, content? And I think it is, it, it is uh, essentially important because of the conversations that we've had throughout uh, uh, the festival, conversations of framing, conversation of privilege, because if you are included in the media, it is your story that is being told. There is a certain way in which that story will be framed to privilege you and the issues that you have. Then it gives you the opportunity, first of all, to understand the challenges that you have, if it is news media, for instance, and then to also understand the opportunities that you can tap on, and essentially to just have conversations about your plight or your opportunities or your challenges in the public domain. So the guys who are included in the media are privileged. And therefore, for us to address the guys who are not included in the media, and of course, uh, maybe I'm speaking like a researcher, the most important uh, thing that we need is data. What does data say about the voices that are included? And we can actually do this through just looking at the media content that we consume, whose stories are told, and who is telling those stories. Hero that data will story. tell us, yeah. yeah, that data will uh, tell us who then is left out. All right, Hezbon, thank you so much. In the interest of time, I'm going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you for joining us in Nairobi. I know that you're also following online. So why don't you see what the rest of the panelists are going to say? Hezbon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Hezbon Ovila. So for the next part of our discussion, we're going to have a panel who are going to join me here on stage. I'll invite them shortly, but you are also part of this discussion. It's actually not a panel discussion as such, it is a town hall discussion. Are we together? Yes, so I don't want people at the back there sleeping. We are all involved in this discussion. It's about inclusion. But the first person who I would like to see on stage is Florence Chohanjirwe. I, I really hope I said that well. <laughs> 
Florence is a sexual minorities editor, as well as special projects editor at Minority Africa. She's a PR manager, communication specialist, and journalist based in Uganda. Uh, her work has been to tirelessly involve and advocate for gender equality and empowerment of the LGBTQI community across the entirety of her career, furthering causes of social justice. Florence, ladies and gentlemen. Next up, we have Simon Eroku. He's a team leader at Science TV Uganda. Simon is a zealous innovator and advocate of ICT for Solutions with over six years working in the ICT and disability innovation ecosystem. As a deaf person, he and uh, he's an avid sign language user, obviously, and his career began in the deaf community where he held key roles in several organizations for persons with disabilities. He left his most recent role as head of advocacy and information at Uganda National Association of the Deaf to embark on building his startup Open Science Impact Innovation, which I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot of. And he is being interpreted here by the lovely lady. What's your name? Nyam. Nyam. Hope. I will not try to say your surname, Hope. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Simon and Hope, ladies and gentlemen. We're also joined by Susan Mujawa Ananda. She is a co-founder of Science TV Uganda, which is an online platform that broadcasts information in sign language to cater for deaf people to make information accessible to all. I think you know her from NTV Uganda, where she has had over 10 years' experience as a professional sign language interpreter. So, makofi to Susan Ananda. We're also joined by Dr. Edwin Luguku, all the way from Tanzania. He's a medical doctor, a creative designer and innovator, working with a medical media company called MedTune. So what they do is work around the next best step to innovate the product used to deliver health information using cartoons. Dr. Luguku. <laughs> And last but not least, from Kenya, Monica Narima is a media professional. Uh, she is one of three founders of Muyambo Media Solutions. It's a digital health content company that's based in Budalangi, that's in the west of Kenya. Uh, so what they do is sensitize the public on HIV AIDS matters through radio dramas. And Monica's role at Muyambo focuses on photography, scripting, audio and video editing, and of course, audience engagement and expert interviews. A hand of applause to all of them. So we've got a very healthy panel here, and we've got an engaged audience, so I'm hoping that this is going to go well in the next 45 minutes. Uh, so I think it's only fair that we begin with Simon. When we talk about inclusion, Hesborn has just told us that the media only covers a select group of people. Do you feel like you're included in the people who are covered by our media? Thank you for the question. Now, about the issue of inclusion, before I would like to speak about what inclusion means specifically. Inclusion means the access to some content, some given content maybe, for example, stories. It means maybe each person tells their own stories and it's best that everyone is included in the story. For example, in the media, you see it's not diverse, and all people do not access, all people need to access the media, but due to some challenges, a specific group does not access, the other group is accessing well, and others are left out. For example, the deaf community, we use sign language and we cannot talk well. Many of us cannot talk, we only use sign language. So you must provide a reasonable way to communicate. For example, you have an interpreter, so that we see a, it's a general vision. Like for example, Sign TV Uganda, 24 hours TV programs are there. One hour program, the deaf people can access that information. For example, I, I can sit on a TV, like at nine to 9.45 when Susan is available and is interpreting. Then all other programs, I do not focus on the TV because I cannot access. So many times I feel like the use of a TV to me is only one hour during the news time because I can 
get the information. And many times I just involve myself in different programs since I can't get myself benefiting from the programs on the TV. Many deaf people in Uganda, we have over one million people in Uganda, and it's very big challenge that they do not access that information. So inclusion is really important for all of us. So there is a big picture which we can make, and it makes it possible for all of us to be, to feel inclusive. So we need that. We need to build a system which makes sure that every information is accessible to everyone. You should at least use captioning, interpreters, or we have online media, for example, on the websites, we can have some way, like the blind people can also be, uh, can access the websites because many websites are accessible and you can add software into it and then it can support a given minority group to access that given information. Then there are positive things maybe on YouTube. For example, media needs to be accessible for all and we need to add our efforts to make everything possible because it's possible. Yeah, uh, agreed. And we're going to be speaking about how to make that possible in just a short while. Uh, but Florence, you're dealing specifically with sexual minorities. And it's not often easy to discuss these subjects when they are considered taboo. So how do local media circumvent that, especially if there's legal issues at play? So, thank you. Um, so when it comes to mainstream media, we realize that there is, especially for sexual minorities, when stories are told about sexual minorities, they're usually demonized. So that's why Minority Africa exists, to give solution stories about the sexual minorities. Because if you check or see anything in mainstream media, there's not a lot of positive stories about sexual minorities. We see a lot of trans persons being demonized as they are just dressing a certain way to dupe or fake who they really are, to steal from people. Those are the main stories we see. So there's a big gap in mainstream media, really, when it comes to telling stories about minorities, and sadly, the most affected being sexual minorities. Yeah. Uh, so. I guess with Monica and Daktari, you're sort of working towards the same agenda, which is healthcare. Uh, so I'll start with you, Doctor. The biggest problem is access. And when I was working for local media, one of the biggest conversations that would get people going is healthcare. Do you feel like we have enough of a representation of that on uh, media, in media? Okay, thank you. We do not have uh, re enough representation as far as healthcare concerns uh, in uh, mainstream media. And uh, I would uh, express this uh, presentation uh, lacking in three main areas. As uh, previously uh, presented, uh, we have uh, a content problem where most uh, media are presenting uh, a one-size-fits-all content. Uh, we are currently having Ebola outbreak in uh, Uganda. And uh, I believe there is uh, uh, enough that is being said about uh, uh, Ebola. But uh, is this content age specific? Are we giving out content that would uh, allow the teens to understand it better, or the children to understand it better, or people that are elderly to understand it better? So there is lacking age specificity. And uh, the other aspect that uh, is missing is a uh, preference of the audience. Uh, back at home, we did a human-centered design when we were working with a project, and uh, it came out that most people, as far as visual arts are concerned, are choosing 3D animations uh, rather than uh, readable comics. But uh, the small percentage that chose comics, should we leave them out of the solution? No, so we, we should also consider people's preference, the audience preferences. Yes, we have a majority that want 3D animations, but the few that want comics, let's create comic for them. And uh, the other aspect there where representation is low is core creativity. We have this uh, uh, unique value proposition for the project that we are working on, and that is called uh, co-creation, where 
each bit of the content that we'll put in the media, we'll put in our social media platforms, is co-created with the audience. At a certain point, we were doing a project on uh, uh, mental health, where we allowed uh, the audience to give us content. And uh, it was very simple. We just asked them to help us search in the social media platforms, cues that are uh, cues in words, in sentences that would uh, give a clue towards a person going into depression. Some even shared uh, their personal WhatsApp chat, and we put it in the social media. The program got a lot of traction back at home, and that was because co-creation was involved. So in these three areas, I would uh, ascertain that we do not have enough representation as far as health concerns are. Yeah. Monica, are you finding that this is the same? I mean, you're working at a very specific level here relating to matters of HIV and AIDS. And I want to specifically talk about language here because we can have representation, but our language is exclusionary. Yeah, I think that's um, true. Like, um, you'll find like most information on health um, is relayed to communities by hospitals and maybe health NGOs. And normally what they do is like they will package the information in either brochures or flyers, which um, will target a specific audience. But if you narrow down and say, now what about, for instance, um, where I come from in Budalangi, how do I reach the illiterate people, uh, an old mama down there in the village uh, who really needs access to information on HIV but can't read a brochure or can't read a flyer? So you, you narrow down and you say, um, maybe I can best communicate to them using vernacular language. So for, uh, for instance, what we do at Muyambo Media Solutions, we are doing um, health, we are doing HIV, um, we are sensitizing people uh, on HIV so that we really reduce the HIV prevalence rate in Budalangi, which is badly off. Uh, in Kenya, we are at 9.8%, while the national uh, HIV prevalence rate is actually 43 So it tells you that we are doing badly, and maybe it's because the people down there in the village don't get this access to the information. So we are doing our dramas in vernacular. We are airing in a local radio station that uh, runs their program in vernacular but we also involve experts. If we find experts that can speak in vernacular to our people, um, I think we are really trying to reach everyone that should get this information. Um, and Susan, you're sort of working on this intersection where you're working with minorities, but also with the majority of society. Where do you think the biggest gaps lie as far as that inclusion in the media? Okay, so, um I think, first of all, it's the language that people in the media use for people with disabilities. Can you give us examples? For example, if you're doing a story for a person who is deaf, why would you call that person deaf and dumb? Why would you call a person who is uh, in a wheelchair invalid? Why would you call a person who is uh, blind, uh, you know, challenged? What makes you think that person is challenged? Don't you think they, they also, I don't know. It's language that is currently present in today's media circulation. It is, am I lying? People cover stories and, and, and they put such words. They, they, in the video you're watching a story and they say, oh a deaf and dumb person was doing this and that and you're like, what? I mean, how would, why would you call someone dumb? We have seen people who, who are deaf but they have studied some, for example, Simon. Simon is a very intelligent man. Why would you call him dumb? Okay, it might be because of the sensitization and people really not knowing what to do. But anyway, I think research is also important. When you're going to do a story, first, first, first research, ask uh, so, which Sorry, just give me a second. There's a lot of noise coming from the back there. I'm sorry, if you would like to speak, you, you may leave the room. You don't have to be in it. But if you want to stay here, please, let's be silent. Thank you. Yeah, so well, we have seen these guys do a lot of amazing stuff. And I think those words of invalid, deaf and dumb, uh, 
they are really not good words. They put them into, I'm imagining if I'm a deaf person and I'm watching a, a, a TV show and someone calling me deaf and dumb, I don't know how I would feel, but I think I would, my mental health would be affected at some point. Or someone who is in a wheelchair and you're calling that person invalid, like, I don't think that is really, really appropriate. So I think for us, from a view of sensitization, in my newsroom where I work in Aten TV, when they are going to do a story, they know I, my specialty is in disabilities. They literally come and, and ask me, Susan, if you are doing a story like this, which appropriate words are we supposed to use? Can you tell us, tell us which words are we supposed to use? That is very key. And I think in English, it might be a little bit polite, but if you change it to, to, to local language here, it's bad. Yeah. People call the people kasiru. Like, who called someone stupid? Someone who has studied? That is wrong. Yeah. So if, 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 I think, if you are doing a story uh, with people with disabilities, do a research. Ask someone. First, ask someone which appropriate words are supposed to be used in that story. Uh, okay, so, uh, wow, I, I'm not even sure where to go with this. Ask someone, who are we supposed to ask? Hesborn alluded earlier to the fact that one of the problems with inclusion is that the people who are being covered are not included in the journalistic world, in the journalistic field. Is that a problem of education? Is that a problem of not being hired? Where are these gaps emerging from, Simon? Personally, I've been, for about 15 years, I've been working around media. For about five years, I've been working around media and communication. I've seen lots of challenges where by many schools, media schools, they do not have the way of teaching the media about the rights or ways of how they can cover a story on people with disability. For example, now, Susan has already said about it, there are those bad words, those bad terms we use that are negative to the community. When covering a story, mostly in a school, they do not teach. The media schools, they need to teach them about what words specifically they need to teach. Then I myself, also in the newsroom, there, there, there needs to be full inclusion. For example, when you're going to tell a story, you need to wait, you must have Good sensitive, good sense of experience from the participant or the person who is going to tell the story. For example, if you have a person who is disabled in the newsroom, you have, you can. It's better if the person tells the story than a person who is able-bodied telling the story. Uh, for example, when you're going to interview me, a deaf person, you tell me write a story, then you you give in the story. It's not good, but it's best you tell me the deaf person during the interview. You interview me as I respond, but not me writing a story and then you speak it on my behalf. Because I can use, according to my own experience, there are words I will use. I will filter out some specific words, but then for you might say something different. So I feel inclusion in the newsroom is also important. But you need to make sure that when you're delivering a story to a given community, you should be sure that there are people who are also in that specific community who are getting from that story. You must have people who are going to share the story from the disabled group, a story about maybe the minority groups. We need to have the different people included in the newsroom at that, at that specific time. That makes everything perfect. We need to improve on that. Similarly, before I used to work with Susan, I've worked with Susan for many years. So we have experience in different communities. We have met very many media people during interviews. They ask very many things. But one challenge I've seen about them, all the content we provide sometimes, the things, they, they take them their own way. They do not use them. At the end of the day, you see they have written the story and they do not ask you to comment before they publish it. So it's really hard for us to make things perfect in a story. So we need it both ways. As Susan has said, we need to build up something that can help provide perfect information to the deaf community or any other community. That's why we also thought of Sign TV Uganda. So we have 
We have partners, Aga Khan gave us the opportunity to come up with the Sain TV Uganda because this is a very big it, it's a very big TV to hope that deaf communities in Uganda to access information. And now Sign TV is there online on YouTube. You can subscribe, like our page. It's there. It delivers information in sign language, communication, news. Uh, there is an anchor who is a deaf. She signs, and we get the news. So we also have the captioning there. We also have the voicing, so it's inclusive uh, that you can, if, if it's a hearing person, you can hear as you're also watching the signs. Because, so you see, Sign TV is really very inclusive. We all programs must be accessible to all people. So we feel each media should copy and learn something from that, from Sign TV Uganda. And that can make inclusion and equality. That brings up inclusion and equality. Yeah, um, uh, I just, just, just to add on something, like to give an example, technically. Uh, there is a time we were doing a story on a deaf person, and uh, this uh, reporter went and covered a story on um, uh, this guy was doing electric, he was dealing in electronics, and he was deaf. He was really doing an amazing job. And when the, the, the camera guy was covering, was, was shooting the, the story, was, was cutting off the gentleman here. The way you would, uh, you know, someone who hears and talks, you just have that shot. But then for a deaf person, you're supposed to have this shot so that you can have the hands. So at the end of the day, when the story was covered and was aired on TV, we could not see the person signing. We just saw the person, the hands were moving, but we could not see the signs. They are just small bits that it doesn't really take a lot. Just knowing information. I think that is it. Yeah, uh, but I was going to ask the doctor because, you know, when it comes to something like health, I think it's easier for most people to rally around that because it affects a majority of the population. And so my question is, how do we get people who are outside of these groups to care more about what is happening within the groups? So uh, I think uh, the greatest uh, opportunity that you can see as uh, uh, other members of the panel are discussing and uh, each and every one of us is here is uh, collaborative uh, journalism or collaborative efforts into making uh, inclusion and the diversity of the content. I'll give an example. I'm working on, uh, let's say, mental health uh, uh, topics, creating visual arts and uh, creating animations out of them and sharing them on YouTube. But I have an uh, opportunity to have Simon pitch in and uh, also uh, uh, offer sign language interpretation of the content that I am giving. So we, we, with these uh, uh, collaborative efforts that uh, we, we can create within the media house, uh, partnership programs, uh, uh, trying to create uh, uh, hu humility out of uh, uh, one's content and asking another person to join you in uh, making it a better, uh, a better thing to go out for the audience. I think we can have uh, a much more better inclusion and uh, diversity of the content in that way. Uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, I was talking to Monica at uh, a certain point. They are doing a drama for... Uh, drama for the uh, local community at where she's uh, implementing her project. Back at home, I am working on same content on HIV AIDS, only that it is in Kiswahili language. So at a certain point, she may not have to uh, start working from scratch. She can take content that I have and translate the same content, which is uh, in a storytelling, it's uh, co-created, uh, it's uh, educative and yet entertaining. So I think uh, we just need to uh, put hands together and see the best person to help me with uh, attaining inclusivity of my content. Yeah, uh, I'm just thinking now, because as we said, your job specifically deals uh, with people who are living with HIV and AIDS, duty of care. It's one thing to include people in the conversation, it's another thing to expose them to stigma and these crazy things that happen within our societies. How do we strike that balance? I believe um, it's through such discussions, like the ones we're having here. Um, if people are sensitized, a lot of sensitizations has to be done so that we reach uh, to that level. But I want to believe that um, if we have such conversations, one, um, it will make people change their mindset um, and not stigmatize uh, people, for instance, those who are HIV positive. 
I also want to believe that um, such discussions can always, uh, if given to, or if it involves uh, policy makers in different countries, I mean it will always shape uh, policy making. Look for example, um, what we are saying inclusion, uh, the media inclusion. I would feel like um, the media owners, uh, all other stakeholders would need such discussions, such information coming from such cities so that uh, they shape the policies in the right direction. So I think such discussions are what will take us there. Yeah, although sometimes I do feel that public involvement can come and really make the waters murky. I'm remembering, for example, and this is a question for you, Florence, uh, in Kenya we had a big debate on uh, intersexuality and one lady wanted to officially become, actually she, it was a man who wanted to officially become a woman. And when it became a public discourse discussion, it just degenerated to name calling. Uh, how do we ensure that the integrity of the discussion is left, even as we're discussing difficult and sometimes challenging conversations and topics? Thank you. Uh, so the main thing, the biases are always going to be there, right? But we need to take steps as say minority communities to make sure that we do our own content. We, I think the worst thing about media would be to try to fit in. So the best thing is to create our own content and then how people consume it is, you know, up to them. Doesn't that create or doesn't that risk creating a bigger divide where people will say, mm, that's the channel for the gay people, yeah. that's the channel for the blind people, that's the channel for the who and who and, and so on and so forth? I think the best thing is to create, because if, if we are thinking of creating, the best thing should be to create, first of all, for our communities, right? Because the reason Minority Africa was started is because all the content on mainstream media about most minority communities, and minority Africa is not just about gender minorities. It's about persons with disabilities, it's about uh, persons with albinism, it's about all kinds of minorities. All the media that was out, or most of it, was just very negative media. So we as a community decided to start our own platforms that are telling positive stories or actual stories and the realities of the minority communities, which all the people here are doing. So the best thing is to create first for ourselves and then the people with interest in our communities can always find access to these communities. Instead of putting ourselves in, say, dangerous situations of debating with the mainstream consumers. Yeah. So the, how we can maybe try to blend in is to collaborate with mainstream, which Minority Africa, for example, at the moment is doing a program with Google, and this program is going to use artificial intelligence for newsrooms to use and see the biases in their stories. So if, say, like she mentioned, if you use a problematic term about a person with disabilities, this tool will tell you that this is a bias or this is a stereotype. So such programs we can create, and the mainstream media can consume or use these programs. But as communities, I think the best thing is to create mainly for ourselves, because there is always someone out there in the community that is trying to access this information but just doesn't know it exists. For example, someone might not know that there is a TV that's uh, doing sign language production or publication, and these guys do it. So if they do it, it's up to the audience to try and seek out this information. For example, three weeks ago, I started taking sign language classes and the reason I did that is because I don't want, I want to tell the stories of the minority communities or the persons with disabilities, but I want to understand what they are saying to me, right? I don't want to get the story in the field, go to edit it with someone else, and the person is just getting their own narrative and telling it in the story. So as media people, we need to take steps towards just being inclusive and getting everyone to understand the kind of stories we are telling. One of our other initiatives 
and uh, it's going to be a collaboration with uh, the hub. It's going to be just interpreting stories that are already on our website into with editions of sign language so that that community also gets the messaging that we put out first. So I guess the best thing is for media houses to keep learning and then learning and realizing that if we are creating just for our community, there might be people out there that want to access it but need to find ways or channels on how to connect with us and just focus on the well-intentioned people and just not focus on the negativity of what are people going to say, what are the mainstream consumers going to say, because there's always going to be an audience that needs the content. Okay, I'd like to ask uh, our audience to, involve, to get involved in this debate. Uh, just very quickly from the audience, what do you think can be done to make our media houses or our media content, not just in the newsrooms, more inclusive? Yeah, we've got an answer here. And for those of you who are already practitioners of media, what are some of the challenges you think uh, face us when it comes to trying to be more inclusive? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Omar Hamed. I'm um, a child journalist at Mtoto News and um, a child journalist. How actually. old are you, if you don't 17. mind me asking? Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I'd love to thank actually DW for giving us this opportunity to be here. And um, actually, I do have a few questions and also maybe the answer to that. So allow me to ask the question first. So um, uh, you see, we are child journalists and there are uh, journalists in the room. And uh, we all do go to the field to co collect different news, to collect uh, different stories from different perspectives. I was asking um, if by any chance we are dealing with a story that is is uh, uh, inclusive of maybe um, the uh, persons with disabilities. What are the right terms to us to you know to call them or um, you know to refer to them? Uh, this uh, these people maybe. And uh, now maybe to answer that, um, you see, I am a child, and what I'm going to say is involve the children in media. Involve the children in media because <laughs> you find that if. If our future, if the children are the future, and if the children are the ones being mentored to lead the future, we can have a bright future. If we mentor our children who are, uh, you know, uh, in love with media, like me, for example, we mentor them slowly, uh, give them the, uh, you know, the, the people to talk to, give them platforms to showcase what they have, then I can say that the future is bright. If you involve the children now, then the future is a success. Thank you so much. Please, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've, we've got a second comment, which we'll take. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tabitha Onyinke from, uh, I'm a media viability consultant from Kenya. I'm here with some of my colleagues also in the audience. Uh, I think I'm listening to the panel and I'm, I'm quite excited that uh, a lot is being done uh, towards inclusion. And I think the best way always to, um, to, to enhance inclusion is integration. I don't, and, and, and I think someone tried to mention that uh, you have your own stations and all that, but I think that might not really work well uh, if you want inclusion to improve. But then with the, when you look at the media houses on this other side as well, we don't do a lot of inclusion. Now, our media houses don't have enough people with disability working in them. Because if we had people with disability working within the media houses, then they'll be able to bring in angles that we're not even aware of, the audiences are not aware of. I once worked in an organization where we had uh, a few people uh, with, uh, with uh, hearing impairment, and it en en encouraged almost all the staff uh, we were about 120, all of us sort of learnt uh, a degree of uh, sign language, and we learnt a lot more about people with hearing impairment, and we were, we, it made us very sensitive and very interested in those people. When you're out there, you see someone signing, you really want to get involved in the conversation. So I think that is one other way of doing it. That's a great point. Can I just find out from the room, how many of us here are working with people living with disabilities? So just, just a handful, uh, including Simon Wanzia there at the back. There was a comment uh, there, and then we'll take some answers.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a media viability consultant and also a media owner. Uh, I'm challenged because even in my media, my station I run, I don't have a program for the people who live with disabilities. And from the discussion, I can say that it's one of the things I'm going to implement in my media to make sure that there is a program. But here's my question. It being an FM radio station, how do we, for example, have a program that speaks to the people who cannot uh, hear or, you know, speak? So yeah. okay. that's a challenge. Okay, so let's start with that question of language. And Susan, I'd like you to, t actually, yeah, you can split between the two of you, you and Simon. Because I'm seeing even as people are trying to ask a question, they're hesitant. What's the right thing to say? What's the appropriate word to use? And now with cancel culture, that makes people not just hesitant, but scared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. Anyway, so I am thinking uh, one of the ways is, first of all, inclusion takes a re you know, you have to make an effort. Guys, we are talking about SDGs, leaving no one behind. Why not? Why not working with people with disabilities? They have a lot of abilities. Guys, you, you have to try these guys. We have seen... Anyway, let me not go there. Oh, please, anyway, so, please go there, go there. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've worked with people with disabilities for a very long time, and I have seen their abilities. I mean, you give Simon a computer in just one hour. He would have written a script, done a story full with sign language, captions, and everything. Their concentration is not like yours. You're working on a story and you have, you're hearing things buzzing around. For them, they don't have that. I mean, they are concentrating. Their concentration is very high. Have you seen blind people? I mean, I move with someone in a car who is blind and says, right now we are this place. And I'm like, okay, are we really? They have amazing abilities. You guys, you need to go and work with people with disabilities. So anyway, about the language, uh, I will spot few using a word like handcuffed. If you look out that word on, in a dictionary, I will leave that to you. Handcuffed is an abuse. You can't call someone invalid. How can you call someone invalid? <laughs> How can you call someone dumb? You're deaf and dumb. Those are, those are the words they used to use long ago when we didn't have internet. Go look for those things. They don't need internet. They are there. I'm telling you the truth. It's because the interest is not there, maybe, but it's one step. We take, we take baby steps. I know you will do it. We got only four people in the room that are working with people with disabilities, but I know from here you're going to get more. I, I, I would like to chip in what he said. Yesterday we were talking about podcasts. One of the reasons why I don't listen to podcasts is because I believe I want to practice what I preach. If I am saying we do uh, stories with captions, with video, because we, the people do visuals, really. So one, one, at the end of the discussion we were talking about podcasts, they said you can have a podcast and transfer it to YouTube and have captions. I think that can do. That's why at the end of the conversation, I was like, yay, I'm going to start listening to them if there is that. We, we, captions is not really a hard, of, hard job to do. You can include captions in anything you're doing. Sign language, we have so many people who are doing sign language, and this is like a joke. Do you know your people didn't know that sign language interpreters talk? I mean, there was a joke on TV, someone said, hey, the interpreter on TV talked. <laughs> If I say it in Luganda, you guys will laugh harder. <laughs> Interpret how you get there. Like, is it? We talk, guys. How can you? How can I interpret when I can't hear and talk, guys? It's just knowing us. Get to know us. Get to know people with disabilities, and you'll feel amazed. The way that a lady has shared that when they learn sign language, they felt like, yay! We are learning a lot. Guys, start working with people with disabilities. It's an amazing experience. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah? Good points. Uh, shall we get some more comments from the floor? Yes? 
There's one at the back there. Any more before? Yeah. Third one. Fourth one. Fifth one. And I'm not seeing any women. Can we have inclusion? <laughs> Six and seven. Okay, we'll take the first three and the last four. Thank you so much. My name is Frank. I'm a student at UMCAT. Well, she has said it good, and uh, I would advise our media council to at least go deep harder and uh, recruit more of the people who can interpret those languages so that they be recruited to these uh, different stations for our friends also to feel covered. Well, he said he less watch TV simply because he's left out. So if we have so many of the people can Im interpret for them, I think they will be included in the services. Thank you so much. Thanks for your point. Uh, the gentleman at the back in blue. Olive, I see your hand. Simon, can I please have some water? Um, well, thank you. My name is Amon, and uh, I'm a journalist. But uh, the issue is we are trying to tell stories. And uh, it seems like when we say people with disabilities, it doesn't sound good for some people who are in that category. So I will just like to remind me, or oh, somebody has asked that question, but uh, we would like to know the exact words because we have very many people with different disabilities. Like which words could, you, could we refer to them? If somebody is deaf or blind or what, which words exactly as you who are professional in this category kind of guide us so that we do, we, we do not make the same mistakes the next time we are telling our stories? Because some media houses, they don't have interpreters in sign languages. And so we'd like to make these stories where people, if we are to put or to attach captions, at least we use the best words that we can use to refer to these people. Thank you. It, it looks like, can I, can I, by the way, ask, why is that so important, the, the labeling and the titling? You're the one who asked the question. Why is that so important to you? Um, why I think it is important, especially for me to in, include in the, 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 the people with disabilities so that I can communicate. It's, it's just that I want to communicate to this audience, but uh, I just want to know the exact words. Maybe if I'm to use the captions, let my story be a story that is complete, that can cater to the bigger audience, not only to those who are not dis disabled, but also to the other audience so that they can enjoy and understand what I'm trying to, to tell. The other audience. Yeah. Simon, uh, what do you want to be called? What are the prop appropriate labels? Okay. Generally, I think I, as a deaf person, it's fine you can say a deaf. Because a deaf is an identity. For example, a specific culture, we have our own language, which is sign language, we can communicate. For example, during interview, for example, as you can say, taste or language or what? Like, um, hearing impaired, and I can feel, I can act, I can communicate, I can see. For example, right now, I'm hearing some sounds. I'm hearing, I'm grasping some sounds. Though I can't get them well, that's why I have the interpreter. But my friends out there can hear. So I think saying deaf is fine for me. And also saying... Dump, a uh, dump is not really good because you see, maybe a person who cannot do it, a person who cannot speak, a person who cannot express themselves, a person who is lazy, the, the dump is not maybe good, it's not a right word. So I feel that's negative because it influences the community in a negative way. The, com the deaf community sees like, we are very disabled and not abled, or we can't do anything. For example, yesterday we were talking about the misinformation and disinformation yesterday. So that topic was really very important, and all of us must know, the media should know, that misinformation and disinformation, these wrong words, it's a misinformation to the community. 
So it's a disinformation to the community. We act differently when you tell us such things. So you see that many disabled people can work, they can do everything very well. But if the media says something wrong or a wrong story, people can mean to turn back from that media or anything. So they feel oppressed and feel left out as a disabled people. I would like to give a simple example. If a mother gives birth to a baby, maybe a deaf baby, and from the media you hear that they say deaf and dumb, meaning the mother will go and check in the dictionary what does dumb mean. And when the mother sees that cannot talk, cannot do anything, the mother's heart is going to be broken, will feel very disappointed and will decide to do what? Guess what? Will decide to hide the baby. Wherever she goes, they don't show the baby. The baby grows when, and the mother throws the baby onto the street or every time leaves the baby into the house, oppresses the child, leaves others to go to school, leaves the child home because from the start she had that cannot do anything. The baby cannot do anything. And the mother can wake up later in the future, maybe at 15, when the child is 15, and sees that the deaf people are able, and at 15, says, let me take the baby to the school. And it's already late, 15 years. You see, it's not inclusive in the community. So now we need to see this. We don't need to take up the blame, but the media must think of what they communicate to the people. The misinformation, the misinformation should be worked upon. And let's hear Florence's thoughts because she hasn't spoken for a while. And then we had a couple more questions. Uh, we had the two at the back there, then we had the two ladies at the back. Do you still want to ask your questions? And the gentleman there. And then we'll give you a chance. Ooh, I have to manage this. Uh, all right, Florence. Yeah, so I would like to answer the gentleman that asked for about resources. Uh, Minority Africa has an advanced Africa program that's happening. So since we have so many journalists in the room, you can take advantage of this program. Uh, so Minority Africa is doing trainings in newsrooms, teaching about the right language to use when it comes to um, any kind of minority communities. So you can take part in that program, and then you can also be part of the GBV Spectrum program, which is going to be teaching journalists how to report a, about gender-based violence, which is one of the most problematic areas in news reporting in Uganda. So you can, we have a, an office at this hub, so you can reach out and participate as journalists and learn on how to report first about minority communities and then about uh, GBV. That's a good idea, yeah? All right, the two gentlemen in the corner there, there were only two, the first one with the glasses and the other one with the checked shirt. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is David Ijo, and um, my question is directed to Florence. Um, Florence, you said um, Minority Africa advocates for positive stories of all minority groups, including sexual minorities. Um, I'd love to understand deeper. Um, what positive stories does minority tell about sexual min minorities in our largely biased communities, and how do these stories benefit or impact the moral well-being of our society? Moral well-being. So thank you very much. Uh, so obviously, we are in a very homophobic community. I would trust journalists to be better than homophobic, obviously. But if you check our website, uh, Minority Africa website or our social media, you'll see, for example, I can list some of the stories there. We have a story we did on an LGBTQ church. So there's a, a church that wants, obviously, the gender minorities and LGBTQ are not really respected in most churches. So there's a community that still wanted to keep going to church, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, what's it called? There's a lot of... Religious. Sorry? 
there's a, there's a lot of bias when it comes to LGBTQ persons. So this group created its own community because they still want to pray, they still believe in God, but they wanted their own community. Oh, okay. Does so that make sense? There's, there's a lot of murmuring in, in the room because... You don't uh, believe that LGBTQ persons are God-fearing? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Biases. I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna have to put a, to put a close on that because whilst this could be a very nice and heated discussion, it's not an LGBTQI debate. Yeah. So I would like for everyone to understand that minority Africa, at the end of the day, is not like trying to push an LGBTQ agenda, much as we are covering stories around the LGBTQ community. We cover all kinds of minorities, but most times when you mention minorities, some people think it's just about LGBTQ, but there are so many stories about LGBTQ communities and how they work together to help each other, say, when it comes to mental health, uh, issues of religion, health, access to health, because there's a lot of discrimination, even in the health system, where most LGBTQ persons can't access health services, so things like that. Okay, uh, Simon is giving me the X. It means we have to wrap up, but I cannot do that without giving you an opportunity to ask a question. Um, thank you so much for giving me uh, this opportunity. Um, I wanted to respond to some comment uh, where a gentleman talked about a radio, the one who has got a radio. It is true that uh, um, radio takes a vast group of people. It's listened to a number of people. But uh, one, when you are talking about inclusion, it's more of if you have an online radio, it is much better that you can be inclusive in a way that in that case you can easily uh, hire an interpreter or, an, or do captioning. But when it comes to a local radio station where you don't have uh, an online setting, it's just that you're going to have a deaf person who's going to come and you'll have an interpreter to help this deaf person transmit or communicate to the public. But uh, it's the only thing I wanted to comment on the, on the issue of radio because you had commented about it and you wanted some response. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And in closing this conversation, I want to ask Monica a difficult question because we've seen the reaction in the room when it comes to the possibility of the LGBTQI community perhaps being included in some ways or the other in the media. How do we do that when the audience is not receptive? I'm not just talking about sexual minorities. I'm thinking now of the 80s when HIV and AIDS was the worst thing anyone could have. Ebola right now sort of has the same sort of temperatures. How do we, how do, we do that? As you said, um, you're going to ask me a difficult question. <laughs> but okay, I'll try to, to respond to it. Um, the example you've given that AIDS used to be dreaded um, sometimes back, but lately you could see um, people have knowledge on how we can live with the HIV positive people. And I really strongly believe that it took um, discussions, I'll still go back and say such discussions. When we talk about it, I want to believe that you educate a few people who will live there and they will educate others about it. So I really think like, um, for instance, the debate we are, my sister has been talking about, you could uh, feel um, the audience here, how it feels. It only tells you uh, this is just a fraction of the reaction you'll receive if you're doing it publicly. But then it's through such discussions letting her, um, the NGOs that do that, reaching out and try to change um, the notion we have about these people, uh, not uh, all minorities. I would want to like refer to all minorities. So if we change the perception of few people, they're going to always change the perception of other people. Okay, so to the audience, do you think there will come a time when you will be okay to see programming on the LGBTQI community in Ugandan TV? Okay.
All right, I think uh, we'll let time decide that for us. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank my panel for being very patient and for your insights. I've really, really learned so much. I think the audience can agree that we've all been challenged, and I hope we do take on the challenge. Thank you. A uh, big, big hand clap for our panel. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask Simon, though. He said that um, we don't say we don't say dump anymore. That's a, it, that's a bit um, wrong, right? So what do we, how do we refer to someone who doesn't speak now? Uh, let's ask Simon. Yeah, Simon, you said um, you said that uh, dump dump is not a good word to use anymore. So how how do we describe someone who doesn't speak? Um, Do we say do we say mute? Do we say speech impaired? Can we turn on the mic? Is it switched on? Yeah, it's on. Okay, it's on now. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. You see, we have the Washington group of questions. It's a tool being used uh, to carry out research. It talks it talks about accessibility and the challenges of how a person, the person, uh, uh, the challenges the person goes through. So it's, it's a tool which, which describes the different challenges this person with disabilities face to access services. For example, they use a word barriers. If a person has a challenge with speaking, they can say it's a difficulty. It's a difficulty in hearing. It's a difficulty in mobility. It's a better word to be used. Right. Not to use the other negative word. Yeah, because I- Like I, challenge. No, thank you very much. Because I know, um, I think for a very long time, we used to 